So first of all, I want to say welcome to our four guests for our first conversation, which is part of Faculty North. I mean, when Faculty North was live, of course, we could have invited you to various places in the North to join us, but um, that's not possible. We're having to do it online and via Zoom, but it's so amazing that the four of you have been able to join us today. And um, it's such a delight to have you for this first conversation, which is going to look at context and discourse. And I think ever since we've been thinking about the faculty, what Kerry and I have always thought was really important was that sometimes people think, you know, in something like new terms like social art or collaborative art or socially engaged practice start to happen, people forget that there is a whole history of this work. There is a whole tradition of people working in different ways with communities and groups. And um, many of people in, you know, in this space, I think, have been doing this for many years. And um, we wanted, you know, people to be aware of you know, the role of place in this work and the role of the context in that sort of sense, but also the context in the way that the art forms have grown, the way that the um, discourse, the way talking about this work has grown, and um, also about literature and research and education and learning, which I know all of you are involved in in different ways, so that we all begin to understand how we begin to speak about this work. And because we can, are able to speak about it together, then maybe we can understand the work better and begin to talk to other people from our participants to funders to you know arts council to everyone in that sort of way so um so our four guests here today and maybe um i can just ask you just to say hello as i as i introduce you <laughs> before we get to the question so first of all um i'd like to welcome barbie Assant, and barbie is a london-based artist curator educator and occasional dj i didn't know that before um, I read your, <laughs> on your site, and her work is concerned with the politics of place, faith, memory, and the history and legacies of colonialism. And of course, everybody here is working in more collaborative, dialogic way with the communities and groups that they work with. So, Barbie, if you just want to just say hello, and then quickly, I'll move on to my next introduction. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but hello, everybody. Um, um, it's good to be here this morning. Um, and part of this conversation. Lovely, thank you. Just so people would know, can read you on the screen that some people may just be listening or something like that, so we can just hear. Um, so our second guest, Isabel Lima, um, is an artist, researcher, and educator, I would say now. <laughs> I've added this to your list. <laughs> Based in the UK since 2001. And Isabel developed socially engaged works with communities in the Northeast in particularly which question the sense of belonging, identity, place, and culture, which are based a lot around her own family's history of displacement. So welcome, Isabel. And what's so lovely to discover, um, as I invited people, I'm beginning to ask people to say hello, is that you all seem to have known each other <laughs> at different phases in your life or come across each other, which is great. Like those moments in Facebook where someone likes something that a friend of yours likes, you think, wow, I knew them from 10 years ago. And, suddenly you start conversations again. So that's the wonderful delight of being a co-director in North, Faculty North, is that you're allowed to invite people you'd love to have in the same space together, and then find out that they, many of them know each other. So Isabel, did you want to say hello for those people who might just be listening? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's very good to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. And third, Hassan Mahamdali, whose background is in theater. He's a playwright, writer, educator, and specialist in diversity in the arts, and as a policymaker, author of the Arts Council's approach and creative case for diversity. But he did say to me earlier that he'd like to be introduced as a trouble causer. So I think, you know, we'll also <laughs> um, include yes. that as a trouble causer as well. Hassan, if you'd... Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, really uh, glad to see you all. I wish I could be with you in person. I really, really do. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's really nice to... Uh, See you, meet you all, and I look forward to hearing from you all. And last but not least, um, Paul Hartley, all of you have met before because Paul is one of the three founding members of Institu, the two hosts of Faculty North. Um, Institu is an embedded arts organisation that works alongside its local communities, and he'll be bringing his own history and practice that led to him to setting up Institu and wanting to work with his local community in a particular context of place and the role of the arts can play with local communities. So, having introduced you all, I'm going to start with my first question, and maybe I'll go around in that same order and then I might change it again. So, I'm going to start with Barbie, and I'm going to ask you 
how would you describe your practice? So tell us something about it, especially in this wider context of more collaborative, more dialogical, more socially engaged arts practice. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, it's very interesting to think about all those different words that you have put into this space, collaborative, socially engaged, um, and uh, you know, we can think about participatory, all of these words that um, I've always found absolutely inadequate to describe what I do. Um, I, th I think in an arts context, if anything is, I mean, it's surely everything is, has some sort of engagement with some sort of social kind of conversation. So for me, I think I've only recently found my language in terms of how I describe my work. And I, I, I draw upon um, uh, Stefano Hani and Fred Moten's idea of the undercommons and the idea of, of study, particularly in relation to black study and the idea of black togetherness and what we do, how we are, where the, where the kind of theories, are. you can go to bell hooks and think about um, teaching to transgress and, um, you know, where we kind of create knowledges and, and kind of thinking about how, how to be. And I suppose because I started in art school, I didn't have that language until I stopped you know, started to research. So now I feel like I don't have to use this, this language, which is very much seated in the kind of Western outlook of, I think, top down kind of ways of dealing with the social um, and much think about more, much more um, as Moat and Harney think about with them, the idea of, of study is the things that we owe each other or the things that we do together and how how we're in in relationship with each other so um that's that's kind of where i am can have i frozen can you hear me yeah you can hear me i can't chrissy is on you're on the so your picture's frozen your picture's frozen my I picture's frozen but frozen. you can hear me yeah we can hear you i think that's the, that's really important the most important thing so yeah so that's where i've kind of been um, thinking about my language, um, particularly because I've been thinking a lot about African cosmologies in my research. And so, you know, I'm thinking about where is it that I'm actually from? What is it that's actually seeding who I am and how I relate to this context of art making, or even if it is art making, you know, it might actually be more community creation and actually, uh, you know, more more about a kind of a development of kind of, um, so it's funny you said DJ, I've also been thinking about um, transformational healing practices as well, just kind of things that are much more seeded in the support of like black and brown communities. What kind of work do I wanna produce? What kind of context, even in my small emergent ways, do I wanna to produce to, to create the kinds of spaces where we can be in grief and in celebration, where we can kind of be with the kind of contexts that are, are, are present here, which are increasingly more volatile to us. Um, and, uh, and that's where my work and my context is sort of sitting at the moment. And this journey has come through the kind of conventional ways of, of, of you know, going through art school, going through all these many, many different kind of formulations of theories around uh, these kinds of practices. Firstly, I thought it was community practice that I was doing when I, I graduated back in um, 20, uh, 20, 1992. <laughs> I thought I was doing community practices. Well, I was, I was working with communities. And then, you know, then I kind of got invited to these things and this language of socially engaged art and participation. And each time I feel like those, those languages have kind of uh, taken a bit away from the kind of practices that people want to develop and for me it was always kind of important to speak to my the communities that I come from people who look like me people who experience things like me people and and to, to foreground those communities to give to give us a space to kind of be to to, to explore to create to do all kinds of things that are just really really important to us um, I don't know if I really I have got anything else to say unless you want to kind of trigger you know a question from that, but that's what I would like to put into the room. I mean, I think that's an amazing and wonderful introduction. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, Barbie, for that. And 
Um, it's interesting that both Hassan and I come from theatre backgrounds, and of course we never had that vocabulary. And not. It's interesting that a lot of it's been imposed from, as you say, from the art world in a way. And um, how do we get back to claiming our spaces and claiming the work that we want to do and the communities we want to work with and things like that, and go back to those radical pedagogy, you know, of people like bell hooks. And I was thinking, you know, Stuart Hall and conjunctures, I keep thinking at the moment, you know, and, and just really sort of look at the way we want to work and how we want to work. So I think that's a fabulous introduction. So thank you. Um, Isabel, do you want to follow? Can do. Um, yeah, so I'm, I've, I'm very similar with to Barbie in some of the approaches. I still don't, I'm still trying to find my language and only very recently, I think I'm beginning to find my language, a language where I've felt at home with. And that's been through Boa Ventura de Sousa Santos is Epistemologies of the South book that for me, finally, when I read that, that book, I just really found all the connections and the way of operating that really struck with me and my practice. I still describe my practice as social engaged art just because it's a shorthand. And like Barbie, it was inherited from, from uh, art school um, because that's, I came into art school as a mature student. Um, and so the way that I descri describe my practice is actually I use art as the potential site of transformation to go beyond representation that strives to go beyond representation and my main objective of going into art school was precisely to find to find the community first to the art school uh, to find a community because I felt very isolated and lonely and I had all of these different kind of mixed feelings because when I arrived in the UK 20 odd years ago it was the first time that I was made to feel like I was another and I was a, a lesser human being. Uh, and that was, I struggled a lot with the way that people looked at me and the way that I saw myself, that, that kind of image, that dissonance, it, it was quite struggling until I decided to actually go into art school. So, so yeah, that's mainly it. That's, I see my role as an artist uh, of, of really trying to be linked to openness and vulnerability. And I, I bring that to the work and also ask that of the people in the community I create in those spaces. And usually I tend to work with people that have ex experienced to some extent the same or very similar issues that I've experienced. So lived experience is very important to me in order to, that dictates kind of the issues and the people uh, and the groups. Thank you, Isabel. And um, yeah, I remember the day that you told me about discovering Sousa Santos, an epistemologist of the South. And I started reading it thinking, oh my goodness, yes, yeah, this is really so important. And um, I think, you know, because you're doing your PhD, I now know that Barbie's doing a PhD and I'm struggling with a PhD. And it's sort of finding those people who are going to challenge the hegemony thinking, you know, that this mainstream thinking around this around all this work and find people who are speaking from different points of view and different using different language and, and beginning to make sense of this work I think is really really important so you know we are we have built up a reading list for the group as well as bringing people along to talk to them and we hope that some of you will find you know somewhere you'll find within this reading list some of the um, ways of speaking about this work and um, that people have found that maybe you know it's more helpful than sometimes you know the mainstream terms that we've all had to describe our work um, under probably because of funding and things like that. But um, Hassan, do you want to go on and tell us a little bit more of your trouble causing, especially around <laughs> some of these issues? Yes, so interesting um, uh, just to hear uh, Isabel and Barbie talk actually. The question of language, uh, which I find, a quite, I find it quite problematic <laughs> in the sense that uh, I th uh, the trouble is in theatre, which is my kind of chosen profession, although I do and do uh, have done lots of things. Uh, theatre is not really a, uh, uh, is kind of an intellectual desert, really. <laughs> it doesn't really have much theory to it in its, in its everyday discourse, um, uh, apart from maybe some very small parts of theatre, but theatre in general uh, kind of shuns theory uh it, it prefers to talk about narratives and stories which i find uh 
slightly intellectually dishonest. Uh, uh, whereas the visual arts, for example, is packed full of theory and theories and language, some of it used to exclude, I think, people. But at least, I, at least, I, you know, I, I kind of envy the visual artists because at least they're they're trained to think. Whereas in theatre, I think probably uh, it's the other way around, with some honourable exceptions. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, I'm I'm old enough to come from a completely different era, really, in terms of um, of, of theatre practice. So uh, I, I did my first acting job in 1984, I think it was. And I worked uh, for theatre and education, in theatre and education, and in what was then called community theatre uh, in companies, particularly in the northwest of England. So I worked for a company called M6 in Rochdale. Uh, we, we had a, all the actors had a revolt and we all got sacked. <laughs> because uh, the uh, the people who ran the company uh, didn't like the political work we were doing, particularly around questions of black and brown history and colonial history. We actually got sacked for trying to stage, the acting company got sacked for trying to stage a play about uh, the Amritsar massacre in 1919 for schools. Uh, and then I went to work for a company called Pit Prop Theatre. Pit Prop gives it away. That is based in Lee. Uh, in uh, near Wigan, and we toured the whole of Wigan Education Authority, which was a very progressive education authority at the time. It had what was called an arts-based curriculum, which I don't think exists anywhere else uh, today in this country. Maybe I'm wrong. It was it was an arts-based curriculum, and uh, and uh, we toured community theatre to the whole of the uh, of the north, doing basically political plays, and. To be a, an actor and a company member, because companies I worked with were all collectives. In other words, we all had an equal say. Uh, the, the, fit, the acting company, there was about six or seven of us, was a permanent company. In other words, we weren't freelancers. Uh, we all had equal wages and we had the best trade union rights of any theatre workers uh, within the industry. So I was brought up really, uh, I was brought up in, in, in that kind of theatre really to be very politicised. So everyone who worked in theatre and education, community theatre was of the left and the radical left uh, of various stripes. To be a, a Labour Party member was to be on the, on the very right wing of the movement. Uh, and interestingly enough, we, we did have um, lots of theatrical debates, particularly around drama and children. So we had particular gurus, uh, people like Dorothy Hethcott, uh, the Russian uh, uh, language theorist Lev Vygotsky. Uh, and we talked uh, and we had an organiz organization called the Standing Conference of Young People's Theatre, which met every year and then met regionally, where we talked theory all the time. Probably a little bit too much theory, but we did take theory uh, quite, um, uh, uh, quite uh, seriously particularly the question of the relationship between drama and the young mind or the young brain. In other words, children's uh, brains, how they, how they thought, how they learnt, uh, how, they, how they learnt as human beings. Uh, the notion that, that the most learning you'll ever do is in the first two years of your life when you learn how to talk and walk uh, uh, and, and converse and begin to have a kind of moral framework and all sorts of things which so you know we we, we talked about that uh, uh, all that kind of stuff a lot but um so i come from a, a, a kind of different generation which was a the kind of post 1968 generation when there was lots of radical change and uh interestingly enough there's an article in the stage this week published by uh, written by uh uh lynn gardner uh, the theater uh, used to be a theater critic at the guardian and she talks about how we're in another 1968 moment when there's kind of the, the tectonic shifts of society and politics are, are changing because of COVID and because of Black Lives Matter. And I believe that to be the case. Um, so I think maybe new language will arise. I mean, the only language I really know really uh, is my inner voice, to be honest that's what I kind of trust. <laughs> and as an artist, that's what I kind of base myself on. It, uh, so it's more kind of a subconscious language, I think, rather than maybe a, a, a theatrical framework in my every, everyday work in my writing and, 
directing and so on. Thanks so much, Hassan. And um, yeah, I think I even predate you in those <laughs> theatre in education and drama in education days. Um, although what was becoming really interesting for me, and I think it's probably really interesting for people to look at, is people are talking about people like Dorothy Hescott again, who is much more about drama in education. But the words, that she, the way that she speaks about the work, and I was lucky to have trained with her for a short time, where she talks about like people, you know, who are writing about social art practices at the moment, you know, the different knowledges that everybody brings into the room, the lived experience that everybody brings into the room, the need for equality, that no one has better ideas than anybody else, and challenges all those hierarchies in a way that I suddenly realized, yeah, that's where we came from. We came from those political backgrounds and those ideas that learning was something that people shared, that knowledge was something that people had to share rather than feeling, as you said, that sometimes, you know, contemporary arts became rather elitist and exclusionary in that way. And also, I think, as you, you mentioned, too, which leads us on to Paul, you know, place companies were very place based, they were very based either in the northwest, in the northeast, in the, you know, um, central London, you know, when we came together, people were very much based in their communities and their place. So maybe, Paul, you'd like to say a little bit about in situ and your thinking about that and how the place has informed your thinking about the work too. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, it's quite nice going after everybody and listening to what you've, what you've all said and picked up on there. I mean, I, I think just, just to touch on, I guess, briefly my own background, there's a few things that I'm thinking about. I mean, what has Anne just been talking about there in terms of that sort of theatre practice? For me, as a practice, that's something I've always wrestled with throughout my uh, life and career. And, and I only feel like I'm, I'm developing a bit of a confidence around that more recently. Um, I really struggled. I mean, I studied as an artist, um, but really struggled with the idea of being an artist. Partly that was a confidence thing around creativity. But as I, as I started to work, which we, as has been described, probably a much more traditional community participatory uh, background, working within uh, sort of youth community settings. And um, what I found was that it was, I found an ability to be able to kind of build relationships, uh, to be able to listen uh, and to be able to make connections for people. And, and really, you know, understanding that actually my practice is very much about a community practice and being an artist. And so I've kind of been on a whole journey in various different roles around all that. Um, you know, working with, with people in, in particular communities that, that are fairly near to where I am in Lancashire, um, but, but working with and bringing in artists who, who could bring that practice that I'm, that I'm interested in and passionate about, and finding that my role within all that was very much, uh, you know, that, that stuff about the continuity, the relationship building, uh, the making connections, all those other things about trying to find the money, doing the advocacy stuff. That, that can, that, that's appeared in different roles, whether it's through local authority or even being freelance. Uh, and actually for a lot of my early work was working with young people. So, you know, I would often, I've worked in a number of youth clubs where, where you know, we've had M6 Theatre come in and, and listen to, you know, listen to something and then spent time before and after talking to those young people about what that's all about in terms of that continuity of the work really. Now for me, there was something, um, Something shifted um, when we were working on projects that were much more about kind of in the communities in particularly in East Lancashire where these programs of regeneration were coming in uh, and communities were being displaced because they wanted to knock down houses. There was something going on there that, that started to really challenge the idea of what for me was a, was a participatory community practice. It felt like it was a constant sticking plaster and it was done in a very short termism way and something coming in towards the end. And the challenge was, is that we were building relationships with people. And once the, resort, the resource went, it's like, well, what do you do? Because we were continuing those relationships. And, and, and there was something that shifted in all that, that when, um, when I was working with artists like Kerry, who's here and William, who you know, we eventually, created what is now in situ. I was seeing something in two artists that now, you know, we describe as, as social art practice or socially engaged practice that, you know, I wasn't using that terminology back then. And we wasn't really using that in the early days of in situ, but there was something going on in terms of the role of the artist that I was really fascinated by. 
there was much more about uh, really trying to understand and unpick those and understand the role of, of an artist within all that. And for me, you know, understanding that I played a part of I played a part of that connection in the work that I do uh, in that sort of listening, conversational relationship building, but kind of had much more of a long term thinking to it. And also that, you know, um, the, the work that these artists were doing wasn't that sort of kind of workshop model that you were going to do something and then walking away. What they were doing was something that in there that was their practice. And that was, you know, I found that fascinating and how I would then work collaboratively with artists like that that we you know is under that under that idea of that practice and, and where that took took me and then where that took the work of in situ and and as Chrissy just mentioned that that thing about place um I think for me as I've as I've as I've developed in my work there's something in my in my early years which has got a connection to religion because I was brought up in a church background that I no longer practice that but I can't really take that out of why I'm doing what I'm doing now in all its complexities and, and good things. In that, you know, I was brought up that, you, that everybody had a purpose and, I, and, and that my purpose within all that and the role that I developed and the decision to work where I am and where I live, which is what in situ is and Pendle is, is where I live, was almost that thing of like, well, this is what I should, I should be doing. And I don't know where that has come from, uh, well, I kind of know where it's come from in various different things, but that is kind of like what my practice is, but it's, it's still quite a difficult thing to describe. But I do feel that it's very much grounded in community practice. And as people have talked about various different, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not very academic, you know, theory is something that I always struggle with. But what I did notice as, as I was getting more into the discussions about social practice and social engaged practice and the conversations me, William and Kerry were having, and the conversations we con continue to have within our team, is that I was starting to see a connection between some texts within community practice that I studied at post-grad that were then being discussed by artists. And, you know, the obvious one is, is uh, Paolo Ferreri's Pedagogy of the Press. And there was this connection between the, those two things and it almost felt like that became like a, a natural synergy of, of where this work is. Um, and then just very briefly, where, where I am, I think I'm really lucky to be in a place where, as we talk about that history in the 60s, 70s, there's still some organisation based where we are that have been going for 40, 50 years that have had that very political activist roots back in that early days, of which I feel like in situ has be become part of that history and part of trying to bring back that discourse and that, that activist conversation um, that might have gone, got a little bit lost in, you know, in the 90s, let's say. I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you ever so much, Paul. And, and it's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that you've, you're in a place where people are still, you know, 40, 50 years of practice in this field. And, and the sort of the links between religion, between community building, between community development, um, local trust are just doing a wonderful timeline of community development thinking um, in the UK and the US over the last sort of hundreds or so years. And it's always it's really interesting where those moments of community arts or arts, you know, with particular groups and things like that. And the thinking of Paolo Freire, or I always think of, you know, Miles Horton and Paolo Freire, as we, you know, we make the road by walking, you know, that, that real link between pedagogy, between community development, between civil rights, and the things that were really important, I think, as you say, maybe up to the 90s in this work, and then gone a little bit lost. But, I mean, noticing the nodding and the agreement with people, um, between people, I think you know everyone here is engaged in those different kinds of ways. So maybe I'll start with you, Isabel, this time, and go around the circle in a slightly different way. But you'd like to tell us a little bit more about a little bit more about that why you do the work you do. You know, what, can you tell us about your journey a little bit about your journey as a practitioner to you know to the point where you are now? Sure. Um, so actually, there was one particular work that I've done, and that work was pivotal. I've done developed that work whilst I still was, as I said, I, I came to art school as a mature student in the UK, even though previously in Portugal, where I'm from, I studied two different art universities, but I, I realized that the system, I, I just, I, I decided actually if being an artist is doing this kind of stuff, then I'm, I'm not an artist because it was very much you you always always constricted to be either a sculptor or a painter and you can't deviate and you need to follow almost like you need to be a servant of a, of a master 
before you actually graduate into become a master yourself. And I thought, well, I'm not an artist and I've given up. And so only as a mature student then here in the UK, I actually found my voice a little bit. And it was a work that I did was essentially, I've decided to do a, a work which was going to film my mom and my dad. And I've actually decided to ask them about their journey from Africa to Portugal during the independence war that was happening in Africa. And I didn't want, so at the time and still now in Portugal debates about the, their colonial past are still not very much, well, now they're a bit more uh, being discussed, but like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, they weren't. Um, and I wanted to get their own perspective, how they rec recollected those moments of, of running away from their place. Um, and then, um, so that work then essentially was pivotal because it made me focus on actually my own feelings of being displaced in the UK, how I felt displaced in the UK. And from that moment on, I decided, right, I need to find people that have the same experiences I do. And that's how I started working and starting to approach other people to work with me. Um, so that's essentially how, how I kind of started. So because before that I was painting or taking photographs and then moved on to performance to a point that I'm now actually doing stuff that you might designate that it's not art, uh, but I don't really care if people perceive it as art or not. I'm not interested in that anymore. Um, I'm interested in doing work that's important for me and for people that I work with. Uh, for me, I always frame it as art. If the art world decides to frame it as that or not, that's not my problem. And that's how I see it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's interesting, isn't it? That whole sort of thing. I often find when I'm speaking to artists who work in these kinds of contexts in the way that, you know, you're all describing is that sort of connection between other people's lived experience and your own lived experience and those connections that we make with communities and groups that we work with and the important influence of sometimes maybe having felt the other or felt outside or, or thinking about how you have those conversations then and make sense and meaning of them. So thank you so much for that. So Hassan, do you want to follow up a little on that? Uh, yes, so uh, I, I find it quite con contradictory actually because I think as an artist, you have to be arrogant enough to think that you have something important to say that other people want to listen to. And that's a very sort of egotistical, self-centered kind of impulse, I think. Uh, and then I have to try, I have to try and match that up with my kind of egalitarian impulses as a human being, which is to say that I am no better than anyone else, uh, uh, and that the working class communities that I've grown up in, or, or, or I've lived in, or even served as an artist, uh, every member of those communities is. Uh, at least, if not probably more important than I am. So it's a strange contradiction that I think we always have to have to wrestle with. And I've, I guess, after all this time, I've come to the conclusion that maybe I do have something important to say, which is probably a complete fallacy and self delusion. But uh, there is an uh, there is an important core to it, which is that I've also learned that art is not the most important thing in the world, and that artists are not the most important people in the world, uh, and uh, and that. I always kind of rail against the tendency within the art world of us thinking that somehow we're kind of saviors or we know so much or, or or we can give to people in some kind of charitable social kind of way or or we can enlighten people as though people are, are living in the dark just waiting for, for the artist with the torch to sh shine a beam on them. So, you know, I, I think we have to try and be arrogant and humble at the same time, which I think is a constant uh, a constant struggle, um, but I, I mean I guess why I, I really do the work is because I I, I absolutely love doing the work. But um, there's a uh, there's a saying in Islam: there's no compulsion in religion, and I believe the same should go for art. That there should be no compulsion in art. Uh, the notion that somehow if only you art touched your life, you'd be a better person, kind of thing. Now I come from uh, an immigrant immigrant background as as all the art speakers do and in one sense you know my mother and father had very little time for what we would call art uh, my my parents went to a west end musical maybe once every two years to see fiddle on the roof or west side story or 
which, which is great actually. Uh, but that but that was it, and um, there wasn't any art in our house necessarily, and art was not a copy of a topic of conversation. Culture was, and popular culture was, I think, uh, and music and things like that. But uh, popular music, but um, art wasn't part of our, our our household at all. So I kind of had a kind of, bit of a, I feel like I had a bit of privilege in one sense, in that my parents worked hard enough to allow me to waste my life as an artist uh, and I've been totally grateful for that um, so I, I, to conclude I think the whole question of me and art is just riven with uh, insoluble contradictions really thank you yeah so contradictions Paul <laughs> what are your contradictions or you know or what are your clarities as well about why you do this work uh, I mean, I think I think it's interesting that thing about the idea of, of, of the ego because I that I think that's partly why, in some respects, creating in situ it just something else I can hide behind and do the work, so it's not on me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you can just get on and do it and and, and work in 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 that way. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I think you know, as as I've mentioned, I think it's this thing about having a purpose, and I think the experiences that I had. I guess prior to in situ, which you know, which I, I see as problematic, is that it's just being able to offer something to try and solve a problem or help a solution or support a young person who's going through you know whatever difficulty or work with a community to to change something in what they're doing and and feeling like there's something I can add to that. And I think you know that at times that is problematic, and now sometimes it's kind of even more problematic. And the learning. You know that you know I'm going for going through more recently, um, and particularly that thing of, of of understanding privilege and where you come from. Um, I think that that the why I do it is is I want to try and understand really what what that role looks like and what I can do to be useful and how that how that interconnects with lots of other people in lots of disciplines, not just in art. And for where I live is to is to kind of have that genuine authentic connection with people to understand their backgrounds. So the, you know, the more I've learned with, with well, friends now who are from different communities to really understand how things work to then help, to then kind of support a process to come up with whatever it is that we do creatively or, or not around all that. And I think it's, it's just that constant learning in that very practical uh, hands-on way for me that, um, that still drives me on to do what I do and why and why I do it. But I can't get away from the fact that it's, you know, I want, I obviously want to do something that feels like it's useful and valuable in whatever way that is, I guess. Thank you. And um, yeah, you made me think of someone that um, Isabel and I were working with, um, at Kate, I think maybe Barbie did too at some point, Tanya Bruguera. You know, and her concept of art util, art that's useful, and um, I think that's a really important thing, aspect of this work, isn't it? You know, if we're thinking about how we can be useful as artists, and therefore maybe what we do bring to communities or groups that we work with. But Barbie, you may want to follow up on that, or you may want to follow up on something totally different about why no, you I came. Do, to... I think this. I, I thank Paul for bringing in this notion of religion um, because I think that's kind of key in some ways because I think. <clears throat> It's also knowing from my own self, I think that growing up in a church or growing up in an African community that wanted, needed a church was really, really important in terms of thinking about what it is that you need to develop yourself as a community. And I think this is where my work lies because I, yeah, all of these languages, art making, art making, being useful even, it's, they are, they're, they're, they're kind of an anathema for, to me because I am not, I'm not in any of that now. I'm starting to really think with the kind of more African indigenous, um, you know, my own African indigenous uh, kind of thinking and cosmologies around, well, who would I have been if I had been, if our communities weren't desecrated by colonialism and slavery? And how would I have worked? And therefore kind of thinking that we wouldn't have had this thing called art. Art would have been artisans. And I would have been somebody who might have been more kind of, uh, you know, sort of, particularly now in my, in, you know, as I'm hitting my fifties is like, 
perhaps more of a, a guide or a, a kind of, um, you know, someone who would have supported like initiations or, you know, so that's why I've, I've started to use this sort of language of healing and, you know, and kind of being in, in, in community in that way, because what I see, there's, there's, an, art, there's an artist that I really love to listen to called Bronte Valers, who work, who's works in, in Los Angeles and in food justice and, um, and dance and, and kind of a number of different things. And there's a doula and, and she said uh, once in one of the, um, her podcasts that I was listening to, that white supremacy is always ready. And it is always ready. And we're not ready because we've always been like, had our, our selves stripped. We kind of, you know, if you think about even this COVID context, like how many people, uh, you know, black and brown folks are, particularly in this in, in London and around is are, are the kind of are the essential workers right so how many of them are dying how many of them are kind of so we're not ready because we're always depleted always sucked of energy always sucked of you know resources always kind of in in that sense so I'm I'm really of the thing so why I I do this in particular the project that I have called De declaration of independence in an emergent way, and I'm when I'm thinking about emergence, I'm thinking about the work of Adrian Marie Brown and how she is kind of drawn on the work of of Grace Lee Boggs and, and and other people to think about these notions of small but deep community work is actually working with women, um, trans women and non-binary um, people to to actually resource ourselves to resource ourselves to be able to tell our stories to be able to kind of find a container now that container that that I didn't know um you know I didn't know what it was what it was there but actually kind of was born out of the fact that uh, you know I was in this art context in Venice the diaspora of pavilion in 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 2017 and uh the, the woman that I set shared my the spaces where I was showing my work in died in the Grenfell Tower fire. They were not resourced, those people. Those people were never going to be resourced. They were never going to, to be given, you know, a, a form of safety in that world. So we have to find it. So I'm very much in that kind of, I would say, study on so many levels of that, of, of discovering where these sources are, like, troubling the languages that are, are there thinking about the kind of resources that that you know black and brown folks need to be able to even to live not just survive or just endure particularly now in this context so why i and i think that that's always been there and i think that's been there from kind of seeing you know how my family have tried to be in in the uk living through you know incredible racism and incredible um you know kinds of microaggressions and you know the national front outside of our school and being in a school that was literally around the corner from where Stephen Lawrence got killed you know I have always been in the presence of death and then also thinking about the importance of of of, of learning from death in African cosmologies so I'm kind of bringing something to my work that I'm sort of understanding more and more which actually is really rooted in something that you know this space couldn't possibly give me but this body can thank you thank you so much Ravi and um, in a way you've led me on to with all that you know rich beginning to sort of you know talk about and talk about your work and, and questions and things that you're you're looking at through your work and, and the way that you're questioning yourself and you know, you mentioned Adrian Marie Brown, and I'm, I'm finding more and more people are going to her, and I'm finding more and more artists that I'm speaking to working in this context are saying, yeah, she's speaking about this kind of work to me. Um, so I wondered whether I could ask everybody, you know, um, who is your go-to person, you know, as far as thinking about your work is now, you know, is there a writer, is there a thinker, is there some, is there just a person that you know, you know, a particular art, a particular community that you that you would say to others, yeah, this is the person that I'm reading, thinking about, watching, looking, talking to. And um, I wonder if I could start with you, Hassan, this time. Um, anybody that you'd like to say, yeah, I, I've found some help and some 
thinking that's been useful to me with this person. Yes, I, I, I think that kind of landscape shifts, doesn't it, all the time uh, in terms of who we who our kind of touchstone is if we have one. I mean, I, I in terms of my own sort of learning, I, I kind of come from the radical uh, black tradition in the sense that the cornerstones of my my uh, understanding of the world is kind of are people like Franz Fanon or Angela Davis or W. E. B. Du Bois. Uh, just on W. B. Du Bois, if no one is, if you haven't read *The Souls of Black Folk*, which I think he published in 1901, W. E. B. Du Bois was an uh, American scholar and uh, activist, black activist and scholar. If you haven't read *The Souls of Black Folk*, you really, really should, because it's a tiny book, and like all tiny, <laughs> a lot of tiny books, it, it holds great, um, uh, great wisdom. Uh, and I'd say James Baldwin's work he does the same, does the kind of same for me. Um, uh, uh, and so that's the kind of framework, I guess, that that that's always has always informed me. Um, but uh, in terms of in terms of my theatre practice, I think um, like theatres of form, I'm a little bit eclectic. So uh, I loved I loved the kind of early community theatre movement in this country. Uh, people like uh, you have to write all this down. I know it's all it's all names and and history. John Fox, welfare state, mm. who used to um, stage huge yeah. uh, community uh, projects, which, to be honest, uh, people have riffed off of mm. forty years later and have made a lot of money out of. But really, it was people like John Fox who started the whole ball rolling. Mm. Uh, you know. You know, at that time, I'm talking about the sort of late 60s, 1970s. You know, they, you know, they, people like John Fox, they, they staged the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 on the streets of Bradford. Mm. What a great project. Mm. <laughs> that always caught my imagination. I don't know why. Uh, and then, so I love those guys who had such, a, well, it's a book called Engineers of the Imagination, mm. Mm. written by, by one of my tutors, mm. uh, a, a guy called Bas Kershaw. Mm. And, and it's it's fantastic just to, I loved uh, I loved uh, Colway Theatre Trust, um, which was the notion of uh, a play arising out of the history of a local community, uh, and the community then acting in that play, and kind of rediscovering their own history. And I think that question of rediscovering your own history is very important to me. Yeah. Um, as I think probably it is to all of us. Yeah. Uh, but the last thing is, uh, uh, well, two things. When I went to university. I came across exper British experimental theatre, mm. which is kind of descended from American experimental theatre. And there was a particular company called the Impact Theatre Cooperative, mm -hmm. who uh, I, I consider to be the best theatre company that's ever existed. Because mm -hmm. they were so experimental, they were off, off the charts. And just that just sparked my imagination. And then when I, was at, I did an MA in theatre studies at the University of Leeds, and the, uh, the guy who designed the course there, a guy called Martin Bannum, was very interested and was part of the development of the kind of post-colonial African theatre tradition. So Wai Sinka studied at Leeds, for example, who's the great Nigerian dramatist, who's, if you've read his play, Madman and Specialist, you really should. It's just, yeah. it's an incredible play about post-colonial uh, Nigeria. But, um, but Martin Bannon brought in to his MA course, uh, people from across the world, so I know I learned a lot about kind of post-colonial um, English, well, not only English, but mostly English um, written um, theatre and those greats. And then that led me on to some of the, the great uh, African novelists, Ngago, uh, Gugu Wationgo and, and all those kind of people, which just opened up another world to me. So, so it's, it's always a shifting kind of focus for me, but I, I guess they're, that notion of experimental theatre, of, of post-colonial uh, African theatre, and then of the grand stages of that incredible uh, community theatre, which I'm talking about, have kind of always stuck with me somehow. I'm always kind of reaching back to, to those at one point or another. Yeah, so, thank you, Hassan. I mean, it's incredible that we could get funding for that kind of work in those days, wasn't it? I mean, my first theatre company was funded by Thatcher's 
you know, enterprise allowance scheme, as I think loads of theatre companies and things were in those days, and yet we were able to produce radical theatre and to sort of, you know, challenge things and things. I think it'd be much more difficult um, these days. But then maybe Paul knows a bit more about, you know, what you're allowed, what you can get away with when you're being funded yeah. in that sense, and uh, questioning things and talking about things, but also who your influences might be or might might have been at some point, Paul. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think what we've tried to do in situ is definitely try and push some of those things about what you can get away with. And I think there was somebody, um, uh, Isabella, it might have been you that's saying that idea of whether it looks like art or not. I Sometimes I have a conversation with people locally about what we do, because I don't think what we do looks like what they think art should look like. So often it's kind of like, what, you, what are you getting away with and what you can challenge? Um, Interestingly, when I was talking about that history in East Lancashire, um, you know, there was an organisation called Mid Penine Arts who's still there for 50 years. They invited Welfare State to Burnley to do a residency. Uh, and that, that ended up creating two more organisations uh, that are still working in, in the area. But was but they, I think they, they staged a... Um, they built the Houses of Parliament and burnt it, burnt it down on a stage. That's right. I mean, that's it's right. quite... Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, they've just done the whole history thing about what they've done. But to have that kind of where we are in, in East Lancashire, it, you know, it, it's kind of great to have that as a, as a, as a, as a nod back and what that influence has, has been. Um, I think, for me, interestingly, the stuff around political thing is, is, is something that's only really just come into play over the last, well, I guess the time we've been starting in situ and trying to understand that dynamic a little bit more. I was never really brought up political in that sense. But then when we've got things like, the only clarion house left in Pendle, you know, we had a uh, little Moscow in Nelson or Red, Red, Red Nelson, it was called, you know, that kind of understanding that element is, you know, I'm on that real learning curve at the moment and, and, and how that connects to the work and where it sits within and the tension sometimes working in between those things, particularly with local authorities, let's say. But for me, there's, you know, there's been pivotal moments and it's usually people that I've just worked with locally mm -hmm. that have been key mentors or, or whatever uh, that have made a difference to me at that point than necessarily say a uh, text or a book or something like that um, and I remember one conversation I was working with a child psychologist because I was supporting a couple of young people at one time uh, and I ended up getting to, into lots of discussions with him about the work and he gave me this book and I'll dig it out and find out it's not I mean it's not a particular I don't know a text as such but it was just basically a book that was written by a youth worker that he, he worked in this uh, estate in uh, Newcastle, I think it was, and he revisited it like 10 or 15 years later and wrote a book about reconnecting with some of those young people that he'd had a relationship with. And it was, it was just a very simple book that had these stories in, but it just really kind of enforced this idea that whatever we're doing now, you know, you just don't quite know what, what will happen because it is such a long journey. And that's kind of just instilled this idea for me about that commitment to something longer term. And, mm -hmm. and for me now, I've got relationships with young people I knew when they were at school mm -hmm. 10 years on and you see where they go. So there was just, that was kind of a real uh, moment to kind of read that thinking then working in the moment and then thinking, well, actually what will things look like or what will those relationships be in, in 10 years? And then there's just, there's just key people that I think have just inspired me from a, like a, a leadership model. And there's a, a guy in particular, and you know, unfortunately he's not with us anymore and he, you know, he's taken far, too soon, but he's, it's, he's a person that helped develop, um, it was part of Creative Partnerships, which was a scheme run within uh, nationally, but there's a, an organization in Lancashire. Um, and I often just think about what, what uh, Chris would think about something as a, as a way of connecting you know, to the work and, and having those moments of what someone else might think if I'm struggling. I mean, I, like Hazan, I do, I do listen to my inner voice quite a lot and my gut quite a lot. I don't always listen to it at the right times, but it, it's definitely a key thing. But it's then just thinking about, well, what would that person have thought or done? And mm. it's just people, you know, that, you know, they're not well known or they're not, they haven't written a book or anything like that. But for me, it's that, because it's the work for me has always been very, very immersive and it's been practical and doing. And the people that you, key people you meet along that way are the ones that have had the most influence on me at different Mm. points and 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 I, you know a very early key moment and again it was universities that was I was sort of lost a little bit in, in whether I should be a teacher or not and I didn't really know enough about this practice but there was a brand new degree that started at the time at uh, at Bretton Hall which was arts and education and there were some tutors on there 
that just really opened up this world to like the role of an artist within communities or within education that just blew my mind when I was like uh, 19 and 20. And really that has been the, you know, the jumping off point to where I am now and a particular tutor uh, there who just opened up this world to kind of artists from Pakistan uh, and places like that, of which I've just had that traditional Western history of art, you know, and, and, and all that is, is just continues to be so relevant today, you know. Mm. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. And um, we did have a conversation to explain to the panel earlier when we discovered how many people had had some kind of connection with Bretton Hall, because I taught there once in the 80s, and um, there were amazing people, I think, and amazing principles about what you know, what art was, what communities were, what, what, whatever, the conversations, I think, were really influenced um, by all those people in like Welfare State and things like that. The Bretton Hall tradition um, still lives, which is great. And Barbie, I could hear you nodding assent and things like that while Paul was talking. So do you want to go on a little bit and yeah, think they, about, yeah, those I, people have influenced you? Yeah, I think, um, firstly, I have to say, it's interesting, you know, things come back to you in a Welfare State thing, because my best friend at college kind of was like connected to welfare state through emergency exit art and kind of did a lot of firework stuff and, and whatever. So I kind of also got a kind of a bit of an education in that way. But what I want to say, and it made me really think about an application I recently wrote um, where we didn't get the money, but one of the things that I think about is my, is my actual kinship group. And I described us as a, loose collective of intergenerational artists, writers, curators, psychotherapists, academics, activists, community organizers, healers, black feminists, abolitionists, revolutionary mothers, queer rabble rousers, Debbie Downers, bringers of pure unadulterated black joy, keepers of stories, co-conspirators, always in the practice of black liberations. In fact, our hyphens are too many to express in this short introduction. So we, we do many, many things. And I would say that it's deeply embedded in a black feminist praxis, which I could draw from say something like um, my dear friend, Gail Lewis and her work with the black, Minute, black women's group and OAD in the 1980s in Brixton. Um, you know, the, the, the activists work that they did, but also the work they did to bring together things like the Heart of the Race book, which has recently been republished, um, thinking about people like Maud Salter um, and bringing together the, uh, the um, passion, um, all these kind of like, uh, you know, Gloria Anzaldúa, um, Audre Lorde, uh, these, this is like, a, this is like our roadmap. This is like a, this, this is given material for, um, for I think for 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 black women who are kind of often at the bottom of the the kind of food chain to be able to kind of keep imagining what is possible, and we do we keep on imagining what is possible. You know, Black Lives Matter was started by black women, black queer women. You know, and look at what they're kind of um, they're, they've kind of brought into the world, and and. I also think that it's really important to think about that through also kind of indigenous work, even when it has been invisibilized, particularly I'm thinking of African traditions. And so I always draw to Sabonfu Somme, who is um, sadly we've lost, but then also just like Paul, there are a number of people that, and this is why I was, what I would say was my ancestral team. Like they're not just my family team or the, the team I, I get through my sort of, work in journeying and stuff, but also people like James Baldwin, people like Audre Lorde, people who have kind of given us roadmaps, but also people that I've worked with, like my friend Matt, who lived across the road, who started Connecticut Blocko, and just to kind of, or my friend Ty, who was a, a rapper who, uh, you know, did a lot of work with young people. These are people that I would call on in kind of some of my in my practices and my ritual practices to 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 help give me direction, um, because uh, people have done this or kept on dreaming this before us, and the only way we can endure it is to remember that and not think that we're reinventing the wheel. You know, yeah, it's hard work, but it's 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 work that has been done before, and we know how to do it. 
Thank you. Thank you. And Isabel, you know, yeah, the people who've gone before. Uh, me, absolutely. So actually, I'm, I've always been drawn to philosophy and theory. I always loved it because I, I, I can get lost uh, in my own thoughts because for me, that's a way of kind of thinking the reasons why I exist and how to live and and all of those things. So I've always enjoyed it more so than actually, I don't have any supposedly artist heroes or references. I, I was never particularly interested in the arts. In the arts, even though I'm an artist, I was more interested in, in ways of being and the reasoning for being. So having said that, I. I I'm going back again to Boa Ventura Sousa Santos. That was the first time actually where theory was a bit more kind of enmeshed with the way that I see the world and the way that I'm positioning the world, which is this recognition that we, we have all of these different knowledges and, and the way that we live here, particularly in the UK and in the West, actually it's not working. And, and the simple fact of when he was able to articulate that all of these oppressions actually are articulated together and why the opposition to these oppressions never, never result and never affects massive change is because they are disarticulated. So in a way, capitalism and colonialism and patriarchy work all together but then the resistance to that is very fragmented. And I think this, this way of thinking in the West where everything is fragmented and resistance is fragmented, then we actually made me think of why I do the work that I do and how I strive to work, even though the systems we've got in place might seem very difficult and it's constant work and it's a process and I get things wrong all the time, uh, but it's always that striving for that future always striving to get better, better at every kind of step of the way. So, and finding that language where he actually draws from, from knowledges from all around the world uh, to actually to compose, it's almost like a guidebook of how to be a researcher, but in a way it's not a researcher, it's, it could be framed as an artist or a human being working in neighborhoods or places or with collectives for everyone. So it's an approach to, to living and to work. So I think that's very important to me. And, and then obviously there, there are examples of, I don't know, the, the community centers in, in Brazil, the way that they approach the, the residents as holistically, not just, oh, we're going to do a graffiti or an art piece or a theater. It, it's all together in, in, woven into one or even in, in Mexico. So, so those are the, my kind of references. Thank you. So I'm conscious that, you know, I just want you to go on talking, all of you. <laughs> but I know maybe people might want to have one or two questions, but I just want if you just answer this final question that I had in my mind, because I think it's about striving for the future. And I just wondered if each of you would just say one thing, maybe that in these strange and difficult times, anything that you've learned or noticed or anything, that is something about that striving and moving towards the future. And I think, Paul, I think it's your turn to go first. Oh, uh, I, I think the, the the bit that's been most most difficult in this recent time, as because I've used the word useful quite a lot, is going through a period of feeling completely useless. <laughs> you know, trying to find that place where you're not the front line or you're not whatever really, and uh, and I think it's. I've just learned to realize that one thing that we do well is to create space for people to come together in whatever format that is. And that when you do that, you know, great things can still still happen if it's done, if it's done right, uh, even amongst, you know, as many challenges as, as we've had, really. Thank you. Hassan? Sorry. Yes, I think... Um... If it's true that uh, the tectonic plates are shifting, and let's say it is in terms of society, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, if that's true, then I think it opens up a whole new possibilities. Uh, my feeling is, is that there's a big kind of struggle going on at the moment. There's some people who are trying to reassert the past, which never worked for most of us 
anyway. So why would you want to go back to that? Uh, and there's people who are trying to break out into uh, new futures. And I think at, at this point in time, I would say uh, we have to break out into those new futures. Uh, we've got to resist the notion of, of going back to the past. Where if you think about it, right, the Arts Council or the Treasury has poured, uh, you know, literally a billion to pounds into basically empty buildings, okay? that the majority of us never went to in the first place, right? That's them trying to reassert the past, which is their, their privilege and uh, their structures. Uh, moving forward, I think we have to try and make our own, we do have to try and make our own structures to be frank. And uh, there's a big struggle going on. It's not just about in questions of representation as working class or, uh, or, or black or as a woman or person of color, whatever it is, you know, do I want to run this, that or the other? It's got to be beyond that, I think. It's got to be about structures because the structures don't have never worked for us. And now we've got to put new structures in place. So I would say, really, is throw away all the templates. I would say, don't listen to anybody, right? And do what the f you want to do uh, and make it happen, uh, whether you get funding for it or not. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Uh, because I think if we are at this point where everything is shifting and changing, right, I think... Uh, uh, I think the possibilities are almost infinite, uh, but it needs guys like you, really, uh, people like you, to uh, to seize the time, as Black Panther Hugh Newton said. Thank you, Isabel. Well, my what I've learned from recent times and what I feel it's important, actually, I'm going to be very selfish here. So actually this year, I found it extremely difficult and there's three words, and those are the things that are, I'm, I'm living at the moment. So one of them is grief. So really important to take time and space and to deal with this thing that I never experienced before, which is grief. Uh, another thing is not to forget. And I think that's been very important to me, not just the personal level and all the, due to grief, but also all the thing actually that's happening, which at the time I feel that I don't have the capacity to respond, but to hold in the back of my mind, so not forget. Uh, and at the same time to be present. I've chose this moment actually to just try and be present and reassess and rethink uh, things because usually in doing, normal times, whatever that, that means, we all, I'm always feel so rushed and working endlessly because it's, it's very hard work and we're always, we're always doing, doing, doing. So this time of pause, uh, trying to be present and think rather than just act all the time. So rethink strategies. Thank you. And Bobby. Uh, thank you all, Paul, Isabel and Hassan for um, what you've put into them, because I think they're all brilliant. Um, definitely, you know, pause, um, definitely time for, I would actually use the language, um, Hassan, of abolition. I think we need to abolish so much of the stuff, not abolish, not just prisons, but just, I mean, one thing that I was just sort of thinking about was a, a, a certain arts organisation that's trying to restructure itself and and I was just like, and that, you know, and, and, and every time I'm always getting people saying, be the director, be the director, be the director. And I'm like, no, because none of those systems are set up to support me to be the director. In fact, the support is, they're there to support me to fail. I've been through so many diversity initiatives and each of them have failed and reinvented itself. And there's another one reinventing itself, which is all about data collection. We can't do it by data collection. So you've all said so many things that are kind of um, wonderful to me, but I think just to kind of follow on from, from um, Isabel, I'm thinking about ritual a lot actually, um, things that we need to do to be in quiet places and reflective places in order to imagine and to integrate because I think one of the things that we could really up right now, excuse my language, but I have to say, is we have people like who, yeah, who don't, who are, you know, really in the place of wanting to, not wanting to change and people that want to sort of generate change. Now, the problem would be to make those polar opposite and to, and for those people who have got the opportunity to really think and whatever, to rush through things. And we can't do that. 
you know this world was built this this world was built in over thousands hundreds of years right of a system so we need to be able to be considered and we need to also think about slow time and different ways of thinking about time different ways of thinking about you know the 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 spiral of time rather than thinking that we're just going there and that's that's throwing out another way of thinking which is you know uh, which is really neoliberal which is this this notion of time which is which is going forward and upward you know so um i'm i'm really in that that moment because i think this confinement that we're experiencing we're not in lockdown we're not you know we're in a confinement as um, to use the words of angela davis is is giving us this opportunity to reflect on how we do that and see things differently so that's what i'd like to offer thank you i mean just thank you all of you i mean i just feel everybody's been so generous and so rich in their their offer and i i feel i've learned so much um it's been a real privilege to speak to you this morning